Okay, great. Thanks. And hi, everyone. And welcome to our June Twin Ports Climate Conversation. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, I'm Natalie Chin, the Climate and Tourism Outreach Specialist for Wisconsin Sea Grant, and one of the members of the planning team for the Twin Ports Climate Conversations. Um, this is our second talk focused on transportation in the Twin Ports, this month with, with an emphasis on non-motorized transportation. Um, and we have a panel of four presenters who will share regional and local perspectives on non-motorized transportation in the Twin Ports. Um, before I turn it over to our first presenter, I'd just like to thank the individuals and groups who are involved in supporting the climate conversations, including Minnesota Sea Grant, Wisconsin Sea Grant, the Northern Institute of Applied Climate Science, the 1854 Treaty Authority, the Minnesota Lake Superior Coastal Program at Minnesota DNR, and the NOAA Office of Coastal Management. Um, for those of you who might be new to the TPCC, uh, these talks are aimed at improving climate co communication skills for all, improving climate change related data collection and sharing, motivating and supporting community based adaptation, and increasing climate change conversation in more sectors to broaden the impact. Um, and as Madison mentioned, please feel free to put uh, questions in the chat box at any time. Um, and with that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, um, who is James Gittenmeyer, Gittenmeyer, the principal planner for the Duluth Superior Metropolitan Interstate Council. And he'll be sharing um, a broad overview of non-motorized transportation in the Twin Ports. Thank you, Natalie. Uh, I will pull my screen up. There it goes. Just a second. All right. Well, um, thank you for having me on this today. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about non-motorized transportation in this region. Uh, my name is James Gittemeyer. I'm a transportation planner with the Duluth Superior Metropolitan Interstate Council. And I've been working here, I think almost 16 years now. And a good deal of the work that I've been working on is non-motorized transportation um, in this region. The, the MIC, for those who don't know what we are, we're a transportation planning agency. Every urban area in the United States has a transportation planning agency uh, doing very similar work that we do. Um, we're all housed differently. Some are in city hall or county government. Some are their own agencies. Um, for the Duluth Superior area, we're housed within the Arrowhead Regional Development Commission. Um, and we have an agreement with the Northwest Regional Planning Commission in uh, uh, Wisconsin. Um, you can see, uh, our boundaries are defined by the U.S. Census, so with the census being 2020 this year, uh, we will have, uh, our boundaries will change a little bit, uh, at least we anticipate that they will uh, change a little bit uh, when the census comes out with the new urbanized areas um, in the United States. And so, but we include the, the cities of Duluth and Superior and Proctor, Hermantown and Rice Lake, and then, and, uh, then the ring of townships around there, and that's the planning area that we focus our transportation planning on, and it's all modes. Uh, you know, from uh, you know, walking, bicycling, to obviously the, the major mode of transportation in our region, uh, the uh, automobile, uh, but also we do a lot of work with the port. So shipping, um, rail, the airport, um, our, we will do the planning and, and that's our role is to look long range and that over the next 25 years and where do we see um, the needs are for our region in the long term. Um, so part of this climate conversation is, you know, is, well, how is the transportation sector impacting, you know, climate? I'm sure you've had many conversations on this. The source of this is uh, from the EPA and, um, and it's uh, pretty obvious that transportation is a large, has a large impact. The transportation sector has a large impact on greenhouse gases, um, generates the largest share, you know, uh, it's, from us burning fossil fuels for our cars, trucks, ships, trains, and planes. And that, you know, over 90% of the fuel used for transportation, transportation is petroleum based and it's gasoline and diesel. Um, and um, as we have a lot of conversations about electric vehicles, I just like to note that electricity is 27% of our greenhouse gas emissions. So we're not totally getting away from our climate change impacts in the transportation world by moving to electric. Um, but I also want to note that a lot of people think, well, um, if we can't get around using our car, we have to get around using our car because our trips are too long. But the National Household Travel Survey, and this is from Federal Highway and the USDOT, 
um, a quarter of our trips are under a mile or less. Those are, um, those are walking, biking um, distances, really easy walking and bicycling distance. And that's a quarter of our trips. And then if you go up 50% of our trips that we take, um, not just our journey to work, but our trips, all of our trips, our trips to the grocery store, trips to friend's house, um, any errands that we run, 50% uh, of our errands are three miles or less. Also, while that is beyond uh, a, what would be considered a routine walking distance, that is, that is a really good bicycling distance. That's a, that's a quick trip when you trip chain with bus. Um, so 50% um, of our trips, have we have opportunities to change the way we uh, travel for 50% of our trips if we have the infrastructure in place. And I just wanted to note, from Federal Highway that, um, that private vehicles, cars, trucks, and SUVs account for 60% of trips of a mile or less. So we are driving for a mile or less for a lot of trips, um, a lot of opportunity there. Um, and in this region, we've been doing bicycle and non-motorized, I should say non-motorized transportation planning for 45 plus years. Um, the city of Duluth had a bikeways plan that that uh, they put together in the mid 1970s. Um, and then there was a lull and then the federal government uh, started to mandate that uh, agencies like mine and all of us in the United States had to do this. We had to do bicycle and pedestrian planning specifically because we were not doing a very good job um, of accommodating bikes and pedestrians in our transportation system. And so in the, in the 90s, um, that was in 91 that the Congress required us to do this. In 94, we we uh, put out our bikeways plan. We just updated it last year. And in 99, uh, we put out our pedestrian plan, which we're updating currently. Um, and then you can see there's a, a bunch of uh, small area and specific plans that covered Proctor and Hermantown, connecting to the college campuses, Cross City Trail. And then what you'll hear more about is the Superior Active Transportation Plan that's going on. Because, and that last one is really important because a lot of ways when we've done uh, non-motorized planning, we have a recreational bend to it um, and design, and we really are moving past that. This is about non-motorized transportation. If people wanna recreate on those routes, that's fine, but the design and everything is made for transportation purposes. Um, all right, I, and I like this depiction here because when we walk around our cities, uh, this is what it feels like. And it may seem a little extreme to have these big cliffs on it, but from a pedestrian perspective, uh, you have narrow sidewalks, um, cars are coming by really quick, they're right next to you in many cases, and, and so it is precarious. And we think, well, maybe it's not that bad, but then I took this picture uh, a couple months ago, and for this person, that isn't much different. You know, while that's a curb that a, an able-bodied person can walk down, for a person that has any limitation, that curb is a massive barrier, and it does feel uncomfortable. And those driving lanes where cars are coming are right there next to that curb. Um, and then in the winter, um, you know, this, there's a pedestrian here waiting for a bus. That means that person had to walk in the travel lanes basically, or in massive snow piles. And then there's actually a couple other pedestrians further down the street that are hard to see um, and uh, that are walking in the travel lanes. So it is a precarious situation that we have created um, in our system. Uh, and bikeways are no different. Uh, I like this cartoon because uh, the bikeway, the one, the picture on the left is a cyclist riding across the tightrope between two cliffs. And for many people, that's what it feels like to bicycle on our streets. Um, it really feels really dangerous. And if you make one mistake, you're going to get hit by a car, something bad will happen. Um, but I like on the right, it, it shows that if we improve the facility, then there will be more than just a few people out there utilizing it. Um, and um, that fear that something bad is going to happen to you is, is found in data. So while uh, you may hear, well, the crash stats don't show a lot of it at things, um, or we don't have a lot of crashes, there is that fear of being hit by a car, and this is really powerful. Um, in Minnesota, the, basically the minimum uh, speed limit on most roads is 30 miles per hour, or I should say the speed limit, um, which actually, uh, I'm glad I kind of messed up there because a lot of people look at speed limits as that's the speed you should be traveling and not the maximum speed that is allowed. Um, and that 30 is very significant because at 30 miles per hour, uh, your chance of surviving being hit by a car, uh, you only have a 60% chance. And then you see when it goes up to 40, 
you have only a 20% chance. And so you see a lot of our roads with 30 mile per hour speed limits and people are traveling 35. It really is endangering people's lives. Um, their chance of surviving in a crash really drops. And so, um, and this year we had the um, experience to see what happens with non-motorized travel when there's less car usage. Um, with COVID stay-at-home orders, we have not seen that little of car usage, maybe since, you know, 100 years ago. Um, you know, cars exploded on the scene and, and they went from almost no cars on the scene in the early 1900s to 10 years later, uh, the streets were packed with cars and we haven't turned around since. And so this was a, a rare, rare um, chance to see what happens to our system. How do people respond to it when there's not car traffic? Um, there was a, you know, for the month of April, the, the reduction in cars was really significant. And there'll be much data um, that will be gathered uh, and we'll find out a lot more in the future about this data during this time period. We only had a small window of opportunity. By the end of April, car traffic was starting to return to normal patterns. Um, so we only had a small period of time. But while that, uh, there were streets closed. The city of Duluth closed a number of streets um, uh, in the area. Uh, for recreational purposes, but it allowed us to see who was using them. And our office, we put out our uh, bike and ped counters to count usage. Um, this one is on Skyline Parkway near Inver Tower, um, counting bikes and peds. But I think the big thing was on this was the, um, well, I'll, I'm jumping ahead. I'll just, the data showed on that Inver loop that we had about 350 people a day using it. Um, compared to car vehicle use on that same segment, um, when it's open is about 1500 vehicles a day. So it wasn't more people using it necessarily, though it was a really small window of op window that we had to look at it. Um, but it was, uh, and the split was about 40, 60s uh, cyclists to pedestrians. Um, but you can see this was, you know, late March, early April, uh, May, when this was closed and there was continued use. Um, weather obviously does change. A, a bad weather day will reduce usage, but we had up to seven, 700 people using it, um, Skyline Parkway. And I would mention that for the bike counts, it was pretty accurate, but for our pedestrian counts, it's an infrared beam. And so uh, if two pedestrians or more across the beam at one time, it only counts them as one. So our head count was probably undercounted. Um, but I think what's most significant is who was using this road. This is not what you see when this road is open to cars. We had a lot of children riding their bikes, um, people walking, uh, families out together in groups. That is not the level of use we see. When, we, when this road is open to cars, we see uh, you know, uh, more of the kind of hardcore cyclists, um, runners. Um, there's just not this level of use. And, and when we think about community, this is, does this really builds community. Um, so as we, so for the non-motorized transportation system, what we have underway and what's been underway for a while now are road diets. Those are a lot of our four lane roads that have now been converted to three lane. Um, and that makes it a lot safer, calms traffic, so it's safer for vulnerable users. Um, we've been converting one way streets uh, with moving from the idea of trying to get cars fast and through our urban areas to providing more access and more flexibility for people to be able to trans uh, or travel on those streets, it slows streets down. It does make motorists upset because the streets get slowed down, but it also um, provides a lot of economic, social, um, and benefits to non-motorized users. Um, we, we've been improving crosswalks. Uh, those uh, push button RFBs that you may have seen around that alert drivers that a motorist is, or a pedestrian is trying to cross. Um, those seem to be, have been real effective. Um, we've been adding bike lanes that you may have seen. Um, it's been a long time in the works. Bike lanes were called for in that 1975 plan. And only in the last really 10 years have we started to really add them into the system. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll go into that a little bit more. And then just building out the core system, the, the really the, that uh, waterfront uh, system of Lake Walk, Munger Trail, Lake Walk, Cross City Trail, connecting all the way up the shore, um, um, making connections to Superior on the Bong Bridge. There's a trail system on their waterfront of the Osagi Trail, uh, Millennium Trail. So really building out this trail system uh, core network. 
Um, what we have ahead of us though, and, and in a lot of ways, maybe we've done many of the easier things and we have a lot of difficult things ahead of us. Uh, adding stormwater green infrastructure, we really haven't done um, that with our projects. We've done some major reconstruction projects recently and we have not added any green infrastructure. Uh, that's something new. Um, uh, bike lanes, and I, the term that many of you may have not heard is micro-mobility lanes. So bike lanes really, when we, we'll put the bike symbol on them and, and say they're for bikes and restrict them to bikes. But when we put in a really great bike way, a bike lane, it is used by all sorts of people, people in, with mobility challenges, people on skateboards, uh, all sorts of people, especially in the winter, if it's, if it's done really well, people will be utilizing that, that lane. And so bike lanes are really way, way more than just for bikes or for all sorts of users. Um, looking at task ahead, a, a better Duluth Superior connection, the Blackneck Bridge is coming up for some major work in the next 10 years. How can we do it, improve non-motorized connections on that? That's, that is on that project. Um, Connection to our major destinations, the college campuses and the mall area that is uh, planning on that work, planning for that is, uh, is underway. Um, and building pedestrian infrastructure for all, we're really having it, it with our pedestrian plan and connection um, plan, we're really having that conversation about what kind of pedestrian infrastructure works. So we're not building what I showed in that first graphic where it feels really uncomfortable and few people use it. And you certainly don't want to walk your small child or a dog or multiple people or multiple children along roads where it's one little slip and, and they're in the traffic lane. Um, land use and building design is a task ahead that's gonna be a challenging one. Um, most people do try to use car to get around, um, but it's really key how that land use, how those buildings are well, they're designed. If they're up to the street with doors oriented to pedestrians, it certainly makes it more convenient. And, and so, um, and then as I mentioned, ac accommodating micro mobility. And so what is micro mobility? It's all of these kind of modes, the scooters, you know, bikes. Um, I've never seen the one in the middle there that's uh, I guess some kind of watercraft, self-propelled watercraft, but it does also include uh, electronic devices. And those are becoming more prevalent. Even scooters are electronic, motorized carts, um, uh, uh, long boards. So, Micro mobility is capturing all of that. And there's lots of discussions of how do we accommodate all these uses? Um, we do not see them getting less in time um, in the future. And I just wanted to show like some pictures of what we could be doing. And while these look like bike specific, really think micro mobility, how do we get around by whatever mode, uh, these smaller modes um, and how we can tie all of our, um, all other projects are, um, you know, better um, landscaping, uh, better urban design into these. And so that was a depiction, but here's a graphic. This is from Montreal. So a place that gets snow and has cold winters and hills. Um, and they've been able to put these uh, protected bikeways or separated bikeways in, and they are really make the difference between whether uh, just a few people use the bikeway system or if we really capture the majority of the population. Um, just another one, this is Lincoln, Nebraska um, that put in and they tied theirs in with a stormwater green infrastructure project uh, through their downtown. So. Just wanted to show uh, a few things like that. And I will uh, be happy, I think we're moving to the next one and then happy to answer any questions at the end, so. Great, thank you so much, James. Um, sorry, I forgot to mention before that we'll try and save most of our discussion for after all of our panelists have had a chance to share their presentations, but we can um, take clarifying questions in between presentations if there are any. Um, I'm not seeing anything in the chat right now, though, so uh, we'll move on to our next two presenters, um, who are Chris Carlson, who's the Assistant Public Works Director for the City of Superior, and Kevin Lickey, who is the Madison Office Director for Tool Design, and they'll be talking about the Superior Active Transportation Plan. All right, thanks, Natalie. Um, this is Chris Carlson. I'm the Assistant Public Works Director for the City of Superior. Um, I want to thank everyone for the opportunity today to talk about our Superior Active Transportation Plan. It's something we're really proud of and really excited about, um, something we've been working on for quite a while, uh, so it's great to share it with people. Um, first, maybe just talk about a couple of definitions, um, just so we're all clear. When we're talking, you're going to hear us talking about active transportation a lot. Um, when we do, what we're talking about is any non-motorized, human-powered form of transportation. That could be walking, biking, running, basically anything that gets you from place to place under your own power. Um, unfortunately, transportation discussions for decades have focused on car and truck travel and pedestrians and bicyclists have kind of 
a kind of a second thought if they're thought of at all. Um, for our plan, what we're trying to do is rather than focusing on vehicles, we're trying to focus on people um, and try to focus on how people move around the city and make it better for them, not just for people's in car, people in cars or trucks, but, but everyone. Um, note also that we're talking, when we're talking, we're using the word transportation. Um, this kind of echoes something James just said. Um, sometimes walking and biking are thought of as recreational activities. It's something you do on the weekend with your family um, to go for a bike ride. But the reality is, well, that's important. Um, walking and biking are really important from a transportation perspective. Um, people walk or bike to work, to school, to shopping, for grocery stores, to the pharmacy. Um, some people do it by choice. Um, they may be doing it for health reasons. They Germane to this conversation, they might be doing it to decrease their carbon footprint. Um, there's also a lot of people that choose or don't choose walking or biking, but it's a necessity for them. They don't have access to a car um, and maybe their only form of transportation. So we want to make sure that we um, service that population that doesn't have a choice in their transportation. Um, the idea for our Superior Active Transportation Plan really started a number of years ago. Uh, we had an opportunity for a grant through the Wisconsin Department of Transportation's Transportation Alternatives Program, um, the TAP program. Um, at, when we had the opportunity, we discussed what kind of project that we wanted to apply for and do. Um, we'd already been incorporating a lot of active transportation ideas into projects. Um, we were doing things like enhancing pedestrian crosswalks with flashing lights and doing better, uh, more exciting crosswalk painting. Uh, we'd been incorporating bike lanes into projects. We'd inv been investing pretty heavily into our sidewalk program. So we thought about those kind of projects, doing a similar kind of project um, under the TAP program. But then we started like, talking about internally and started talking with James at the MIC, and James was a big influence on us, trying to think, so think more broadly. Don't think of an individual project, but how do we create a transportation network for the city of Superior? Rather than focusing on an individual project, how do we make a, a broader plan that we can use to then um, create a network for the whole city. The idea being that when individual, individual projects come up, they fit within a larger plan that benefits the whole city and not just a particular block or a particular crossing. Um, so that's what we did. We worked on putting together a city superior active transportation plan. Um, the stated goal at the start of the planning process was to develop an ADA compliant, comprehensive bike and pedestrian network that would emphasize safety and usability for the people of Superior. Um, so that's what we've been working on, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, before talking about the plan, what I do want to do is acknowledge um, the DOT grant that made it possible. Um, like I said, we applied and were successful in getting DOT funding to do this plan. So that was really, really pivotal to the project to have that funding available through the TAP project. So that's really important. Um, also, I think for a project like this to be successful and have a plan like this put together, it takes a lot of support from um, an organization's administration, in our example, our city administration. Um, our mayor, Jim Payne, and our city council has been really supportive and really advocated for our active transportation plan from the beginning. Um, so that's a huge part of um, what's made this plan as successful as it has and what it will be in the future. Um, so with all that, um, I'm gonna turn the discussion over to Kevin Lickey from Tool Design. Um, Tool is our consultant on the active transportation plan and Kevin is the project manager. Um, they've been great partners in the project. Um, the quality of the active transportation that plan that we have that Kevin will be presenting is owed in a huge part to Kevin's experiences and knowledge with active transportation. Um, he's really a, a master at the subject. Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Kevin and let him kind of run through um, what our active transportation looks like and kind of give a summary of, of what we're, we're trying to accomplish. Great, thank you for that glowing introduction, Chris. Um, I, I appreciate it. Uh, as Chris mentioned, my name is Kevin Lickey. I'm the director of Tool Design's Madison office. Um, we were the firm selected along with SEH as, out of Duluth as a subconsultant to us to help the city in developing their active transportation plan. And um, what I'd like to do today is just give an overview of, of what the plan um, what the different elements of the plan are and some of the analysis that went into developing the plan's recommendations. So the goals of the plan were really to take a look at 
what the existing conditions in Superior were um, today or when we began the plan, um, how conditions are for people walking, biking, using mobility devices such as wheelchairs, kind of the whole gamut of, of active transportation that Chris already talked about. And then based on those existing conditions and, and based on the needs and desires that we heard from citizens and elected officials and others to develop and recommend policies and programs to improve conditions for active transportation in the city, to describe and give the city guidance on different walkway and bikeway types that um, can be used as part of the active transportation network. And then to recommend an actual active transportation network for the city to hopefully build out over the coming years and then help guide them in the plan implementation and, and maintenance of the system as they do build it out. So to start all of this, we really needed a vision to guide our process and working with both residents and the public through a number of engagement opportunities and, and through a steering committee meeting a steering committee that we had for the plan, we developed this vision, which is we envision Superior as a healthy city where walking and bicycling are encouraged as attractive, safe, comfortable, and convenient options for residents and visitors at every age and every life stage. So this is really all encompassing, making sure that people who are choosing to walk and bike, and, and when I say walk and bike during our discussion today, that's really just shorthand for any number of the different modes that Chris and James already touched on, people using scooters, other mobility devices, running, rollerblading, whatever it may be. But making sure that we're providing a network for them that is convenient, uh, that, that is easy to use, that's attractive and comfortable and safe. So that whether they're choosing to bike because they want to reduce their carbon footprint or they're walking places because they want more exercise or they're using one of those modes because they don't have access to a motor vehicle for whatever reason, we wanna make sure that, that the network works for them, that they can get where they need to go um, and, and that the system is safe and attractive for them to do that. So who are we planning for with part of this or with this plan? And, and this really just touches more on bicyclists, um, but some of it also gets at, at people walking. And research over the years has shown that Americans roughly fall into four different groups when it comes to biking. Approximately 5% of people are what fall into the enthusiastic and confident group. These are people who will bike on um, many different types of streets, busy streets, they'll ride in a lot of different conditions. They're not necessarily concerned about if there's a bike lane there, they're, they're pretty confident riding with traffic and, and getting out there. So 5% is a pretty small percent of our overall population. About 51% of the population, a little bit over half, falls into the next category of interested but concerned. And these type of people would like to bike more, but they're concerned about their traffic, about the traffic that's around them. They're concerned about safety. It, it may be that um, they will, will get on their bikes, um, but really are interested in riding on trails or in areas where they're separated from traffic. Um, barriers such as busy streets um, or things like that will keep them off of their bikes. They're, they'd like to ride more, but, but they're concerned about it. And then a bit over a third of the population, 37%, fall into the no way, no how category. These people are not going to bike for, for a variety of reasons. They may have a disability that doesn't allow them to bike. They may just have no interest in getting on a bike. You could build a bike path from their front door to wherever it is they want to go. They're not going to use it. Uh, and then about 7% of the population fall into the strong and fearless category. Again, these are people who will ride kind of all weather, all road conditions, um, they're, they're willing to get out there and, and ride the bike one way or the other. So the people that we're really interested in appealing to with this plan are the interested but concerned. If you build an active transportation network that gets people who are concerned about safety out onto the bikes, then that system will also work well for the enthusiastic and confident and the strong and fearless. It's a system that will work well for people who are, who are out there for transportation, looking to bike to work or the library, the grocery store, wherever they may want to be going, um, but also a system that will, will work well for recreational purposes as well. So somebody wants to go out on a, on a ride on a Saturday morning with their two children, it, it's a system that can work well for that. So that's really who we focused on 
on as we started to look at, um, at developing the plan. So the first step, as I mentioned, was looking at existing conditions in Superior. Superior over the years has, has built out um, a substantial number of active transportation facilities. The Osagi Trail runs along the, the waterfront and is a, is a popular facility, especially at, at this time of year when the, the weather is beautiful outside. The Millennium Trail runs through the municipal forest. Uh, over the years, the city has added um, bike lanes on a number of streets, shared lane markings, and has a good sidewalk network throughout much of the city, although there are gaps as, as we found during our analysis. So I'm going to run through a number of maps just on some of the analysis that we did. It's going to be very quick, but at the end of this, I'll point you to where a draft plan is if you're interested in, in taking a deeper dive into things. One of the things that we were interested in is how stressful is it to bike in Superior? And there's a common metric that's used to look at um, the stressfulness of different facilities for biking on that ranges from one, which is low stress. Those are facilities that typically appear, appeal to those interested but concerned people. They are generally safe and comfortable for children over about the age of eight or nine to ride on. Um, they are lower speed and lower traffic facilities or their facilities that are separated from traffic. So separated bike lanes, like some of those that James showed earlier, um, trails or paths through the city. Um, and from there, the level of traffic stress slowly ramps up. A level two is still generally appealing to most adult riders, uh, low traffic streets, again, lower speed overall, but perhaps not as comfortable as some of the facilities that are more separated. And then we start to get into the level three type um, streets, and, and this is what we start to consider more stressful, three and four being kind of stressful type facilities, one and two not so stressful. Um, these can be lower traffic streets, but with higher traffic speeds, which starts to get stressful for people and concerns about safety, um, or streets that are just carrying more traffic, streets that involve more mixing with traffic overall. And then level four is high stress, where you've got higher speed traffic, um, more travel lanes that people have to ride alongside, lanes that um, where bike lanes may disappear and you have to mix with traffic. Um, so we looked at traffic volumes throughout the city, speed limits, lane configurations, um, and found that you know, by and large, the city is pretty good for biking. The majority of streets, the vast majority of streets fall into the low stress category. They're nice neighborhood streets. Um, they're easy to ride on, but those low stress streets are broken up by busier streets and, and higher speed, higher volume streets that really create islands. So if you're looking to bike somewhere out of your neighborhood, that can be problematic. And if you're looking to get some of, to some of the city's trails or, or pathways um, or to a destination that's, uh, that's across town, those, those higher volume, higher speed streets really break things up into islands that are more challenging to navigate. We also were interested in where people might want to go. And, and so for this, we did a, an analysis that looked at the potential of different parts of town for people to walk and bike. This looks at things like population density, intersection density, employment density, um, destinations such as libraries, schools, commercial areas, um, things like that. So that, um, and then forms a composite map that, that kind of shows areas of less potential for active transportation use. Um, you can see that if you know Superior, many of the areas in the blue here, the cooler uh, colors, are um, industrial um, or just kind of more vacant areas. Um, and then the, the green, yellow, and then the redder is the more potential for, for walking and biking, which tends to correspond more to areas near the UW Superior, some of the more downtown areas where we've got higher population densities, um, a, a greater density of destinations for people to go to. We were interested in safety um, and where crashes have been occurring. So we mapped out uh, severe crashes that have occurred over the last 10 years or so. This map displays pedestrian crashes. Um, we also looked at, at bicycling crashes over the past 10 years. And by and large, Superior has a relatively low number of both pedestrian and um, bike crashes, but there are some serious ones that, uh, that occur. And there have been a number of fatalities over the past few years. So, we're interested in seeing where those have occurred, um, 
what changes might be done to address some of those concerns. Some of the streets um, shown here, you can see there's a number of crashes al along Belknap Street. They may be hard to see on, on your screens, but um, Belknap has been rebuilt over the past couple of years, as you know, much of Belknap has, and, and now has improved pedestrian crossings, better bike facilities. So it, it's hopeful that some of these um, changes that have occurred with the street design will start to see improvements with the safety overall as well. Um, we also uh, wanted to ask people what their experiences walking and biking were. And, and we put together a web-based tool that allow people to make comments about their walking and biking experiences. They could highlight streets that they thought were good walking routes or bad walking routes. Um, same for biking, good and bad biking and, and destinations and barriers that they see. So the map here highlights some of the results from that for bad walking routes and good walking routes. So, so the blue lines on here um, are, are streets that people flagged as, as good and, and the red are ones that people flagged as bad. What's interesting is you'll see some streets that got flagged um, both ways, which gets again at people's individual comfort levels. Some people are perfectly comfortable walking on a sidewalk that's immediately adjacent to um, a street that, that may have higher volumes of traffic. Similarly, um, on our biking map, we see some streets, um, tower showing up here as both a good route for biking and a bad route for biking. Same with Belknap. Again, that gets at people's individual comfort levels. Some people are fine getting out and mixing up with traffic a little bit or riding in a bike lane immediately adjacent to traffic without additional separation, while others are not comfortable in those situations. So asking people where they were comfortable or where they weren't helped to feed into um, our, our re recommendations overall. We also asked people where they wanted to go. They provided us with a, a whole host of different destinations that they look to get to, and then some of the barriers that they face. And in the web tool, we are able to, to see specifically what their comments were about barriers at specific locations. So we took all of this information as well as discussions that we had had with people and started to put together recommendations that, that went into the plan. And the recommendations really focused on what are called the five E's of bicycle and active transportation planning. And those are focused on encouragement activities or, or actions that the city or its partners can undertake, education um, and outreach activities, enforcement. So things like enforcing the rules of the road for all users of the roadway, engineering, which is building new facilities, sidewalks, um, paths, bike lanes, and evaluation, measuring what the city is doing and what sort of progress is being made. We put together a toolbox that highlights different walkway and bikeway um, facilities that the city can use. And, and I'll touch on that a little bit more in a couple of slides. And then we started to put together the actual active transportation network. Um, and the table here shows in orange existing facilities that, that the city had um, for different types of facilities, bike lanes, shared lane markings, trails, bike boulevards, separated bike lanes, and then paved shoulders. And then the blue is planned facilities. So you can see we recommended about 10 miles of bike lanes, um, about another eight miles of trail facilities, close to 15 miles of bike boulevards, which are low traffic neighborhood streets to guide people through the city, about nine miles of separated bike lanes or side paths, and, and another seven and a half miles of paved shoulders in some of the more rural areas of the city. The map here shows our pedestrian focus areas. We, rather than looking at all streets in the city to, to see where there were gaps in the sidewalk, we focused our analysis on where are there sidewalk gaps where people might be looking to walk or where it's particularly important. And the yellow area highlights what we called our focus area. These are streets that are busier arterial or collector streets and areas around schools and the university and, and college and town. So, Within those areas, we then looked at where there were sidewalk gaps and the red lines represent areas where we recommended sidewalks be installed. The green pluses that are shown on some areas show where we recommended um, improvements to crossings for pedestrians. Uh, this map shows the recommended bikeway network and, and there's a variety of different facilities here that are shown. Um, you can see it provides a, a pretty good system of connectivity throughout most of the city. We have facilities that reach down to South Superior, 
uh, out to the, the east end, um, and, and then especially in the, the core areas of the city where we saw earlier that there's a lot of potential demand for, for active transportation. The plan um, helps guide the city with some implementation strategies. It, it offers opinions of probable costs, so roughly how much it's going to cost to build out the recommendations. Um, the sidewalk construction is approximately eight miles of recommended sidewalk throughout the city, which is estimated to cost about $1.9 million. And then called out eight specific locations for pedestrian intersection treatments to really improve those crossings of some of the busier streets. We also on the bikeway side helped prioritize projects into short term projects, which um, cover about 17 miles overall and, and will cost about $300,000 to implement. Medium term projects, approximately nine miles of facilities at about 3.6 million. And then long term projects, which are ones that will be more challenging to implement either because the, there isn't a whole lot of room within the street right of way to implement or they're just higher dollar projects that, that may, be, um, may take more time to plan the funding for those. And, and that represents close to seven and a half million dollars worth of work. We also called out seven priority bikeway corridors for the city. These are ones that could be high use that help connect existing facilities within the city um, and, and should be a high priority for the city. These really, again, link different destinations that were important to the public we heard uh, and really came out of that public and stakeholder input. The plan also provides recommendations for maintaining the system over time from things like winter maintenance to ensure that the system is usable year round, as well as just ongoing maintenance to make sure that the pavement stays in good condition for people and, and isn't presenting a hazard for users. Finally, the plan also includes uh, a walkway and bikeway toolkit that I mentioned earlier. This provides guidance on the implementation and use of 21 different facilities and treatments for walking and biking. It gives city staff um, considerations to think about as they implement different things, design criteria, as well as references to more specific design guidance that's out there from different um, organizations such as the Federal Highway Administration. The plan is currently in draft form. We wrapped it up shortly before um, COVID-19 hit and we were ready to present it to city council. Um, but given the uh, current restrictions in interactions with people, we've been holding off on that presentation until things get somewhat more back to normal. I expect at some point this summer, um, we'll be doing our presentation to council and, and asking the council for adoption of the plan. There's a link that's available here and we'll make sure that that's available to participants as well, where you can download the different draft components of the plan. And I know we're gonna hold questions until uh, we get through our last presentation. Great, thank you, Chris and Kevin, um, so much for that. It's really uh, exciting to hear about all the work that's happening in Superior. Um, and so for our final um, panelist presenter, I'd like to introduce Dina Ryan, who's an urban regional planner advanced for the Wisconsin Department of Transportation, the Northwest region. And she's gonna share a quick state perspective of non-motorized transportation planning in the Twin Ports. Thanks, Natalie. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Um, yeah, I just wanted to touch on a, on a few things. Um, at, as Chris Carlson mentioned about the, the uh, state administered uh, TAP program, it's a transportation alternatives program. Um, that is a cyclical competitive program that's open to um, communities, counties, uh, um, and MPOs statewide to um, produce plans that um, provide um, alternative uh, modes of transportation, bike paths, um, uh, um, multi-use paths, um, safe routes to school, um, you know, anything that has to do with uh, um, like pedestrian or bikes. Um, and, and the communities that produce these local land use plans or specialized detailed community plans like the active transportation plan, um, um, the Wisconsin DOT utilizes that in making um, sound decisions as far as design decisions in, in our um, uh, program scoping for our projects. So it's really beneficial to both the communities and to um, the DOT um, so that we can um, uh, 
plan a full modal um, transportation system. I'd also like to mention that um, Wisconsin uh, DOT is updating their modal and multimodal long range transportation plans called Connections 2030. Um, and that was finalized in 2009. So it is really needs to be updated. Um, and that is being updated now and it's called Connect 2050. And within that plan, we include our, all of our other state plans, which is the Wisconsin Rail Plan 2030, um, Wisconsin uh, State Airport System Plan, the State Highway Plan, the Wisconsin um, uh, Bike Pedestrian Plan, which is, um, is also being updated at the same time as Connections um, 2030, and also our State PED Plan, which hasn't um, been updated since about 2009 as well, and that's being updated. Um, and what, what the DOT envisions with the Connection 2050 is that all these plans provide a full range of um, modes to um, provide sustainability not only to the built and human environment, but also to the natural environment. Um, James mentioned the Blotnick Bridge. And that is a MnDOT bridge, but it is also, uh, we also par partner with MnDOT on the bridge. Um, it's 60 years old and uh, MnDOT is looking at um, uh, either rebuilding the entire bridge or just doing this, um, the main span. Um, there's a study going on right now and whatever that's gonna look like, they don't know yet, but um, we're partnering with MnDOT and uh, both DOTs agree that there needs to be um, a bike ped a pedestrian connection on, on whatever the new bridge is gonna look like because currently the only pedestrian um, connection is on the Bong Bridge. And that's quite a separation between the two bridges. And the two communities are very close um, and they're both active communities that, um, that the transportation um, uh, departments need to, to support that type of healthy environment. And I guess that's all I had to say from the state perspective. And so I guess I'll just turn it back over to Natalie and Madison. Great, thank you so much. Um, I'm actually gonna turn it over to Hillary who's gonna run our uh, Q and A. Hi hey everyone, uh, my name is Hilary Sorensen. I'm the climate specialist with the 1854 Treaty Authority and we will get to questions for our panelists in just a moment, but I just like to thank all of you for presenting today. This was super interesting. I didn't know any of this stuff. Um, really quick before we get to any questions, which feel free to type those in the chat box and I can read those out or once we get to it, if you want to just unmute yourself and ask your question aloud, that's completely fine too. We wanted to do a quick poll about our, the format for our July 21st TPCC. So the topic, we're going to start a, a, what will hopefully be a series of conversations around climate justice issues, sort of generally and then focusing on our particular area. And in order to kick off these conversations, there is about a 20 minute pre recorded webinar from Antioch University and the Association for Environmental Sci uh, Studies and Sciences. And this is this focuses around race and the environmental movement history and legacy. So it's about a 20 minute webinar. So our options for July are to either hold our pre established slot of 12pm on July 21st watch the webinar together over Zoom and then have a live facilitated discussion, or because we know July gets a little tricky with vacations and field work, we can have a sort of app on your own TPCC where we will send out the link to the webinar. You can watch it on your own time and then we'll accompany that with a document for self-reflection and other resources so that we can start to learn from each other and our organizations um, what, what those climate justice issues are and what different folks are doing to address them. So the poll you can find at the very bottom of your page, uh, the Zoom page here, there's a, right next to the participants button, there's a polls button. 
and there will be two options for this July 21st uh, climate conversation. And then just a plug for August, we will be um, reconvening again over Zoom and the topic will be green infrastructure in the Twin Ports. So thanks for filling out that poll. And uh, at this point, I will get to the questions. So first, um, sort of a general one for all of our speakers. What can TPCC or Twin Ports Climate Conversation members do to support non-motorized transportation efforts in the Twin Ports? Are there any actionable steps that you all would like to see um, folks doing? I can, I can start and uh, certainly let uh, others join in on that. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of planning. You know, we went through um, the amount of planning we've done over the last 45 years. Uh, Kevin went through a really, his, the Superior's active transportation plan, which is really great. Um, that is a lot of work. Um, that's a lot of hard work. However, it's much harder to implement these, these items. Um, there, there's, there are trade-offs and, and for many people, um, the, the way we get around is by car. And so uh, there's a lot of thought that there's a loss there. There's a loss. If we don't make it easy to drive, that's a loss. And so it makes it very diff these conversations very difficult um, to make these trade-offs. And it, it basically backs many of the roadway authorities, the local governments into a corner where they just put back what was there in the first place. Um, so what can be done is that this is, this is a community conversation and a community priority. Um, why one reason I'm glad I'm, I was able to present to the, this group regarding climate change is because that's one of those um, uh, groups I have not had any conversations with uh, really about how non-motorized travel is we're talking about climate change. <laughs> we're talking about um, what the impacts is of our transportation system. So it really is getting out there and making these connections. Um, these are not comfortable conversations to have. There are some really uh, heated public meetings that we've been through. If you follow Superior Street in downtown Duluth, uh, 8th, 9th Street, and like these are really challenging conversations. But uh, the more people are involved and um, and, and being a part of this, letting elected officials know, but it, it's, it's not just a kind of a one or done thing. It's that it's continuing to remind people this is uh, a necessary and needed change that, you know, for all people, for climate change reasons, for equity reasons, for all of this, and that it, it's not just a, uh, um, how it always gets kind of portrayed as, well, we're just about bikes. This is way, way beyond the conversation about bikes. So all our bike lane fights in Duluth have been, way beyond bikes, but they only get portrayed as just about bikes. So um, that's where I, I guess where I'll start. <laughs> Any other presenters wanna jump in on that one? Or I see a couple of questions popped up in the chat box here too. This is Kevin, I'll just quickly add, I think James's comments are good. You know, it's good to let your elected officials know that you value good places to walk and bike for all of the reasons that James just, James just cited. Um, that if there are specific projects that come up that you weigh in for good walk-in, bike-in, active transportation facilities, it is often just opponents to projects who come out and, and have, make their voices heard. So um, make sure that your voice is heard. The other thing is if you walk and bike to different destinations, try to let the people at those destinations know that. I think many local shop owners or other people um, often assume that, that their clients are arriving in car um, and may not value um, having bike lanes on the street in front of their business or nice wide sidewalks that are easy to use. Make sure that local business owners are aware that you're arriving on foot or, or on bike or scooter, whatever it may be, and let them know that things like bike racks and, and other types of facilities are important to have. Okay, there's a few questions in the chat box, but I would also just like to say that we'll be hanging around for an extra 15 minutes for additional discussion in case uh, we run over time. But for those that need to jump off, um, completely understand that. Um, please do remember to fill out the exit poll that will pop up when you click out of this. Um, so questions in the chat box. This is for any presenter. What do you think is the biggest impediment to improving micro mobility infrastructure in the twin ports? I can start again. 
I mean, I really, I, I think it's, um, like I said, we have the planning, we have planning and plans in place. Uh, we, in the last, especially the last five years, we have the technical capabilities now. We have designs and things that we can apply that, that we, it was a little less clear. So we have a lot of the technical and planning work done. Um, it is really the, to me, I, I kind of say community will. Um, do we, you know, and, it, I, and I guess maybe it's it's more than community, it's community will. It's um, the folks that, you know, the, the bicyclists that really want great bikeways, um, the, the folks that are focused on the climate, um, public health folks, our hospitals, we're not, they're not all aligned behind this um, to really make the case that this is something we should do. Um, how it gets portrayed publicly is it's just a very small number of cyclists that want this infrastructure and everybody else doesn't really. Not if the, if the trade off is too much to cars or, or basically anything for cars, there's a trade off at all. Um, I think it's aligning all these different groups that have a like interest together onto this to make it happen. Um, I, I'll add on to what James says. Um, it's it's really important um, with what, um, uh, with the plans that we do have in place, and that we keep updating those plans. <clears throat> um, you know, like the, the every four years updating plans, or even more, just because, um, like from from the state perspective that's, you know, that's where we base a lot of our design standards off of and, and, um, and what projects are going to get advanced, you know, to, um, to be to be built. And so, and, and before we do build those projects, you know, we're always asking the public's input. And so the more the public talks about what they want, I mean, that changes the whole dynamic of a project as well. So that's all I had to say about that. Um, this is Chris from Superior. I'd echo what James and Dina just said. Uh, from a public works perspective, um, we talk a lot about our core services and our core service in public works is transportation. And I think a lot of times what James said earlier is true where it's seen that if you can invest in active transportation, you're taking away from your core service. You're taking away from road travel and cars and trucks where I think you need to change the Perception where it's not taken away from the core service, that is your core service, providing transportation. That includes cars and trucks, but also includes pedestrians and bicyclists as well. Um, I think another impediment is, quite frankly, funding, um, finding the money to do some of these projects. Um, I think a lot of times after transportation projects get done because they're being done as part of a larger project, a larger roadway project, and they're added on that project, which is great. But funding-wise, I think it's hard sometimes to actually fund a specific active transportation project just to do something active transportation uh, tied to a larger road project. And one other impediment I think that comes up a lot is winter. Um, some of it is based on reality and some is based on perception. Um, from a public works standpoint, there's a reality to winter and maintenance of these facilities can be a challenge of resources, um, making sure that paths are kept clean and, and usable, sidewalks are kept clean and usable. Um, so there, there's a reality to it, but there's also perception to it too, where the perception is we have winter, it's very difficult, stuff's covered with snow, why even bother building it? Because it's going to be unusable for nine months of the year anyway. And I think a lot of that is, um, like I said, perception and it needs to be, um, communities like our own need to find ways to maintain it and make sure that perception doesn't become a reality. Thank you. So actually, I misspoke. The uh, exit survey has just been posted in the chat box along with um, the links if you'd like to sign up for these notices and uh, to the recorded previous recorded presentations on the Minnesota Sea Grant uh, webpage. So those links are all in the chat box. Um, another question here. Have you observed or measured changes in trail use before, during, and throughout the COVID pandemic? What are some of those changes that have been observed and are there differences across different types of locations? For example, uh, a city center trail like the Lake Walk versus more remote trails. We have collected data. We have not uh, 
analyze that data to be able to answer that question. It's a great question. And we, but uh, we have collected, uh, we have a permanent uh, bike and pet counter on the lake walk so we can compare years uh, to be able to see level of use. Um, we did move our portable counter, as you saw, I showed you an example on Skyline, but we did also have it on the Cross City Trail where we have counted in the past in order to be able to analyze that uh, bef kind of um, before and after. Um, our plan with Skyline will be is to go up there next year um, if everything returns to normal then and do a count and see and to kind of do a, a during COVID count and, and do a non-COVID count uh, to see that. Uh, the biggest thing uh, uh, from what we, like I had mentioned, is that it was uh, who, how, it, how these facilities are being used, who was using them um, has been the change. The Lake Walk, that has, you know, it's closed to cars, so it didn't, you know, the change there would probably, would probably reflect more of that um, we would anticipate it would have less commuters on it in the morning and afternoon as people were staying home. Um, and, but we haven't analyzed the data yet to see all of that, but we will, and I love that question, and um, we'll have to get a report out there um, once we've got it analyzed. This is Kevin. I'll just add, um, I'm based in Madison, and they have looked at some of the trail counters here in town, and they've seen a fairly substantial growth in use on the trails. Um, since the lockdowns locally began, the other change that they've seen is that typically all transportation is has two main peaks during the day. You're kind of morning rush hour and evening rush hour, and that's true on the trails here as well, since there's a good number of bike commuters. Um, and, and people who may park somewhere and then walk to downtown. Um, they've seen those peaks kind of flatten out as people's travel behaviors have changed. So people aren't necessarily traveling at eight in the morning and five in the afternoon. It's a more even spread throughout the day. Um, the other thing is anecdotally, you, you may have seen news reports that the second wave of hoarding uh, as part of the COVID thing is not toilet paper, but is bicycles. It's impossible to find bikes in stock. Um, shops have been running through bikes like crazy. So at least anecdotally, um, people are, are getting out and about on, on bike and assumably on foot as well a bit more. All right. Any other questions that people want to ask out loud or type in the, oh, here we go. I have another one here. Um, are the trail count data public? Is there a central place to go for it? And who all are collecting trail count data? It, I mean, it is public information, so, but we don't have a uh, website uh, where we have that data that uh, the public can get to. Uh, the, um, my office, the MIC, we work with the city of Duluth. We'll actually work with all our cities to, to move this counter around and then we give them um, the data. Um, uh, uh, MnDOT has also uh, been really behind uh, getting this data. And so they may actually have something more on their website. I haven't uh, found if they have or not. But uh, currently right now, it, it, we don't have a great site like we with traffic counts you can go to MnDOT's website and look up your traffic count on your street um, as long as it's more than a local street uh, they'll have be, they'll have a number and account on it we don't have it to that level um, just yet uh, but you certainly can contact me um, uh, for any of the data that we have and right now we're still building baseline data so we we're moving the portable counter around to just get kind of a, a baseline level of use um, right now we have it along central entrance there's a trail up above central entrance in Duluth that we're counting we have no data on that um, at all and so we're, we're just like I said just trying to get this baseline data so and I see Kevin just posted the city of Madison count data that's available for 14 pedestrian counters downtown so thanks for that all right Okay, there's another one in the chat box. Um, how do we put ourselves in the right place at the right time to comment on infrastructure projects and lend support? Um, this, this person feels like she's always uh, two steps behind on being aware of projects. I think that's a pretty common one. <laughs> yes, um, that is that is a very common, that's a great question. Uh, there are, uh, so some transportation projects, particularly the federally funded ones, uh, you get a you get a multi-year window. So, uh, for example, today 
our board will be uh, recommending um, or we're recommending the board approve our transportation improvement program. It's a four year listing of projects. So every um, urban area in the United States has a transportation improvement program, what we call a TIP, and it lists all of the federally funded projects. So you at least know where your federally fund, your federal funds are gonna go over the next four years. Um, local projects, however, local funded through, uh, whether it's sales tax or however else uh, local funded projects are at, um, your uh, city, well, your city has a capital improvements program, not as hard fast as the, the tip that you, but it still, it gives you a good idea of when projects are coming up. Um, the year the project is happening is generally too late. It's generally too late. And that's usually when people realize that a project is happening, but planning and the engineering work is taking two or three years before that project. Um, gets constructed. And so um, really uh, these tips and, uh, and these CIPs are, are the place to go to see where projects are. That's where I look for what, what's coming up. Um, and, uh, and so um, that's probably the, but every city and county has a CIP and it's usually five or 10 years looking out and you can kind of see where the city is going or the county is going with their projects. And then the, the state and the federal prod funded projects are in these, uh, what is called what is the transportation improvement program at state level it's a state transportation improvement program those are linked together um, and they are listings yeah if i could just uh jump in on that this is andrew slade uh in duluth and uh, i'm an active board member with duluth bikes uh and uh the easy answer to your question about how to find out what's going on is to call james because <laughs> he knows it all but that's not fair to him and it's not fair to good public process so uh, one of the things that we are hoping to do at Duluth Bikes, and we're just starting to kind of get it off the ground, is uh, to for us to, as from a citizen perspective, try to track uh, especially bicycle-related projects. Uh, and so at least our internal board knows what's going on and can do sort of comprehensively look at things as they're, as they're coming along. Uh, we're not there yet. Uh, one of the, it is a task that I'm um, trying to uh, trying to uh, move forward in, in, in the, li the limited time that I have. But uh, um, at any given time, there's you know at least five, six projects going on uh, that, 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 uh, that our board is would like to track and that are, are the, the, the members of Duluth Bikes, uh, many of whom I see here on the call, uh, would, would like to track on too. So that's a, certainly a direction that we're headed. I can maybe follow up on that too, because I know it's super frustrating um, from the bicyclist side. You know, when a project comes up and you want to comment on it to be told, oh, it's too late. But then it's like, well, how do I know far enough in advance to comment on it? Um, so I'm on the, um, the MIC Bike Pedestrian and Advisory Committee along with Dina and James and a few other people here and um, Jason. One of the things that we're working on with the bike implementing the bike plan is getting that capital improvement plan information from all the road authorities, kind of a series of related questions, you know, what plans do you have coming up all together, you know, which things do you know overlap with bike facility improvements and stuff like that. So we're working on that, but it would be nice if the, if the, <laughs> the BPAC and the uh, could use the MIC website to try to push some of that information out there. It's really nice that Duluth Bikes is working on that. Um, and I think you should still be super involved, but it, it seems like you shouldn't have to do that too. So we do need to find a better way to get a clearinghouse of information out there with the lead time. Because speaking now with my hat on as the county, with the county um, public works department, they're really open to talking about things as long as there's enough lead time. So how do we make that happen? It's in our, it's in our interest too, as a road authority. Anybody else have a question they'd like to ask over the aloud or see anything else in the chat box? I think Julie might have had a question earlier. Um, let me find it. Sorry. Uh, oh, it was, do any non-motorized transportation planning efforts include public, public education about the benefits of non-motorized travel? Um, and she references a Sweden uh, study from Sweden. Um, 
that has a countrywide public education effort focused on elementary age children. I know Wisconsin DOT has some publications that I, do, I, I don't have them right at my fingertips right now, I should, but um, I can share that with you, Natalie, and maybe is there, you could put it on after this? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think in Minnesota, Minnesota Bikes has a big program with bikes and curriculum that they take, which is a nonprofit. I don't know, James, if you know of other things. Yeah, I was just gonna, uh, there are a number of, uh, this year we didn't have, uh, but there's a whole bus bike walk month that has encouragement and education events added about uh, non-motorized, actually it's not, it's bus walking and transit. So it, it's the um, multimodal approach there, but uh, there are educational events as part of that. And then in the fall uh, with Safe Routes to School work, there's educational efforts uh, with the schools that take place. And so usually it's a school take a lead and then they, they ask for help with providing education to the students. And so, uh, but both, I should say not both, but the Duluth and Superior School District have um, received uh, federal uh, transportation grants to uh, build curriculum for educating students and purchasing a bike fleet so students can learn how to ride a bike. Um, and, and so there has been efforts in that over the years as well. That's kind of where we are. There's, I don't know if we have a real, I wouldn't say we have a robust program, but uh, as we kind of pull resources together, we, we try to do what we can. I will just add um, Minnesota's Lake Superior Coastal Program um, offers grants for um, the Minnesota side, um, funding coming from NOAA. And so you could look at our website on the DNR um, web page or on the DNR website, there would be a, a web page for Minnesota's Lake Superior Coastal Program with more information about our grants. And um, so that could include some planning efforts as well as education outreach um, for benefits of non motorized transportation, as that would definitely help the environment. Thank you. I have a question, this is Tom. Can you hear me? I assume you can hear me. Um, a while ago in Duluth, uh, there was an initiative. It didn't pass, but it, but it did go to a city council vote to allow for lower speed vehicles on the streets, like golf carts and electrically powered vehicles. And um, thinking about electric bikes and things too, and then those micro my, mobility devices and things. And are some of those falling in the cracks, if you will, between road automobile planning and bicycle trail planning? What are we doing to encourage electrical um, powered low speed vehicles? We are really just at the beginning of how do we plan for these? Uh, what's the, you know, the right way? How do, how do you mix, you know, what's the right mix, you know? Uh, if we create a facility that's for pedestrians, uh, what else can you add in that facility that is appropriate? And then what do you need else? And, and uh, it's kind of why I was mentioning uh, the uh, separated bike lanes that maybe those aren't separated bike lanes, but just separated micro mobility lanes for um, faster moving, but not like car speed fast, but you know, slower moving compared to cars, but uh, faster moving compared to pedestrians um, facilities. And so, but there's research going on, what is the appropriate mix and how do we design for that? Um, I know that as we put in trails and separated bike lanes that these uh, micro mobility modes will, will gravitate towards them. Um, I've seen them in other cities, scooters use the bike lanes um, and uh, uh, actually, and sometimes there's more scooters than bikes in the bike lanes. So uh, we, but we don't have a, we don't have a really uh, um, good, great direction on how we do this um, at this time, but it is something we're looking at and trying to figure out. Thank you. Thanks. And just a note that was shared in the chat box. Um, Natural Resources Research Institute has operated webcams at the Hartley Pond at the zoo and at Park Point Beach for a couple of years. 
Um, so the video hasn't been analyzed, but could potentially be used for estimating trail traffic. Um, so there's some contacts listed there too for any folks that are interested in learning more. Well, we're a little past 1.15. So um, once again, I know a couple of our speakers had to jump off, but I wanna thank everyone so much for joining today in the conversation. And uh, we will be emailing out um, details for next month's conversation. And uh, feel free to go on the Minnesota Sea Grant website and look at recordings. And there are a lot of links in the chat box too for additional information. Thanks so much. Thanks. Okay.